Welcome uh, to this uh, policy link panel on the EU and the UN shared challenges, same vision with a question mark. Welcome to the panelists here in the room, people uh, before and uh, behind cameras. And of course, welcome to all the people following us at this moment from behind uh, their screens. This is uh, a bit of a particular situation we're in. Uh, we all know why. Uh, but in any case, welcome wherever you are. My name is Philippe de Lombarde. I'm the director at Interim at the uh, United Nations University, UNU Chris. Um, I will first of all present the panelists of today. I will do this in the order of their initial uh, intervention. Uh, welcome to Ambassador uh, Veronika uh, Boscovic Pohar who is the representative to the Political and Security Committee at the Permanent Representation of the Republic of Slovenia to the EU here in Brussels. Uh, she has served as a Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Slovenia to France, the Kingdom of Morocco, UNESCO and also the OECD at, in Paris uh, and uh, Deputy Director General Multilateral Relations, Development Cooperation and International Law at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, Slovenia. Uh, Mr. Felix Fernandez Shaw, also welcome uh, to the panel. Um, I have to read your bios because they're all very wrong. Uh, you are the Director for Sustainable Development Policy and Coordination at the European Commission DG International Partnerships, previously and better known probably as DEFCO uh, since uh, 2018. You have also been working on sustainable development policy and the external actions budget of the EU as an expert in the cabinet of uh, Federica Mogherini before. Uh, and you were also responsible for relations between the EU and Africa at that time. Uh, you have also been the head of development cooperation coordination division in the European External Action Service. And prior to that, uh, you have been working as a Spanish diplomat in the Spanish Permanent Representation to the EU, in the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also at uh, the Ministry of Justice in uh, Spain. Uh, welcome also to Barbara Peche Monteiro, who is the UN Secretary General's representative to the EU and Director of the UNDP Representation uh, Office here in Brussels since uh, 2014. Uh, prior to this appointment, uh, you have served as UN Resident Coordinator and UNDP Resident Representative in Cuba, uh, also as Country Director with UNDP in Colombia, uh, as Deputy Resident Representative uh, at UNDP Guatemala and also in Nicaragua. Prior to that, you have been working also uh, for the, in the Sahel post-crisis group also in Angola and Mexico before. Uh, and then finally, we have our discussant uh, of today, which is uh, Professor Emeritus Mario Tello, a professor at, uh, of international relations at the ULB, Université Libre de Bruxelles, and also a professor at Louis University in uh, Rome, and also a professor at Macau Institute for European Studies in China. Uh, you have served as president, vice president at the Institute of European Studies, which is a co-organizer of this uh, conference, and also as the political science department uh, of, uh, ULB, of ULB. You have been consulting with the EU Commission, the presidency of the European Council, also for the European Parliament. Um, and of course, you have been publishing a lot, uh, uh, almost 50 books I saw, uh, so you have two more to go for uh, your golden uh, jubileum. Uh, many publications, but there is one publication I would like to single out, a very recent one, I think you have it with you. Uh, at some point you can perhaps show it to the camera. It's a, it's a report, a very recent report on reforming multilateralism in post-COVID times for a more regionalized, binding, and legitimate United Nations. So it's, um, so thank you all for, for accepting our uh, invitation. And we are very much, of course, looking forward to uh, this uh, panel. 
As I mentioned, the topic of this panel is uh, the EU-UN shared challenges, same vision. The idea is to have a, an exchange of ideas in a, say, a trilateral way. We have the, the EU um, uh, with us. We have a representative of the UN uh, organization with us. And then we have the academic world uh, represented by uh, Mario uh, with us. Hmm. Um, EU-UN is, is a very particular relationship. Uh, it is a relationship between the UN as an organization and then the EU, which is an organization uh, consisting of a subset of, of UN uh, member states. Um, from an academic perspective, there are a number of aspects to it, of facets that are that can be studied and that are actually studied. We, of course, try to narrow down this uh, a little bit at least, but providing, I think, enough space for, for each of you to, to, uh, to approach this topic from your own uh, experience and, and expertise. We have circulated a few questions uh, among us, and I will briefly go through these questions. Um, and then I will give you, uh, each of you, then time to, to, to intervene and, and give your uh, views on these. There are two types of questions, two sets of questions, basically, that we would like to um, uh, answer or discuss. There are questions related to uh, this, the relationship between this EU partnership and, let's say, shaping, reshaping global governance. So that's one level of, of analysis, uh, you could say. This is, uh, on the one hand, global governance in, 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 in a broad sense, hmm? referring to, for example, this ambition to strengthen multilateralism more in general, but it also has to do with global governance in specific, more specific policy areas, uh, such as uh, sustainable development, climate, uh, food, uh, and so on. 2021, and this is uh, also uh, something we would like to do in this panel, is to focus on the future and the near future um, rather than the past or the very far future. Um, 2021 is the year of the uh, joint communication on uh, ECEAS joint communication on supporting multilateralism, which has been published in, in February. Um, questions that emerge there are, well, this, this joint communication, what is the, the, the importance of it? What is the importance of it? And how does it relate to this EU-UN uh, partnership in, in this context of strengthening multilateralism as, as an ambition? 2021 is also a year uh, with a number of uh, summits coming. Um, there is the UN Conference of the Parties on Climate and Biodiversity, the UN Food Systems Summit, the start of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, obviously the UN General Assembly, and there are other summits uh, coming up. These summits are spaces spaces in which um, countries, regional organizations, international organizations uh, come together. Questions there that emerge is, okay, how can we use these, these spaces, these opportunities to produce effective if results? And, to, to, um, and also how can the EU and the UN uh, and their common member states coordinate in, in that context. I know that there is a lot of, of skepticism also uh, uh, often with respect to these, these summits, but let's, let's um, look at the opportunities that, that they also offer um, for us. There is a second set of questions at another level of, of, um, of analysis, if you wish, uh, that is at the level of countries, the country level, the operational level. How do EU and the UN collaborate uh, on the ground? Um, the EU has been defining its priorities and programming for the next uh, seven years. This has been done in consultation with the UN. Questions that we can answer or try to answer is, okay, how can this cooperation on the ground be strengthened? Also, uh, the EU focus on acting as, as a Team Europe, how does this relate to this EU-UN uh, partnership? Is Team Europe 
simply uh, neutral to this or, or is it not neutral and why? And then finally, uh, questions related to operations of the EU and UN in specific crisis situations uh, where resources have, been, have to be mobilized uh, quickly and importantly. How can EU and UN operate together in these crisis uh, situations and what can they do better uh, in the future? So these are some of the questions we would like to to cover, but of course you are free to 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 give your um, views on this and to approach this from your own um, perspective. The way we organize this panel is as follows: uh, each of the panelists will have initially ten minutes maximum to uh, give uh, your uh, views. After that, we have in principle forty minutes for an interactive Q&A session with the people uh, following us from behind their screens. There is a possibility after the first round to quickly react to, to what the other panelists have said, if you wish. If not, we, we start immediately with the Q&A uh, session. Uh, to the people uh, who are following us uh, from behind their screens, please use the chat box to ask uh, your Questions. So once again, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. And I think we can start with the first uh, round. Uh, I would suggest that the ambassador starts with uh, your views and then we, we follow this uh, sequence. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon uh, to all. Uh, first, uh, let me thank you for inviting me uh, to this conference, the International Affairs Conference, assessing the EU capacity to act. Um, of course, I will, um, in 10 minutes, uh, uh, more rounds, you, you told me, I will try to, to focus on uh, uh, what is my role from the Political and Security Committee, as you know, uh, covering uh, common uh, foreign uh, and security and common uh, security and defense uh, policy. Uh, from the perspective of the Council. Um, I think this discussion is very timely because, uh, as you know, we are uh, in the process of uh, building uh, EU strategic uh, uh, autonomy. We are also in the process of building uh, resilience. And uh, when building resilience, we built, of course, uh, partnerships. Um, and UN is one of our uh, strategic uh, partners. Um, uh, well, we all we are all very well aware that uh, EU and UN approach uh, to development cooperation, comprehensive ap approach to peace and security, human rights architecture is uh, one of the areas of uh, alignment of the two organizations. We have a long-standing uh, mutual uh, cooperation, peacekeeping, civilian and police military crisis management, and it will also remain uh, the priority uh, uh, of EU engagement in peace and security and defense. Um, we're natural allies, uh, of course, uh, when tackling uh, global challenges. And uh, of course, we also uh, now in this moment, as you said, and uh, uh, I saw your, your book, uh, I, will be, uh, I will be very, very much interested to, to read it as well. Um, what, we, what we experienced in the last uh, uh, 10 years uh, uh, are our crisis, our vulnerabilities. And um, we, we also uh, are very well uh, conscious that uh, of our interconnected world, uh, revealing the necessity of cooperation, multilateral uh, cooperation. Um, what I think we will have to, to, to deal with, EU and UN, is first on our, our own um, reshaping. Uh, because if we want to, to, to position ourselves in these critical international uh, uh, and facing international challenges, um, we will have to face uh, the, 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 the reshape of EU because of that we have also, as you know, probably the, the, the process of future, uh, conference of future of Europe. Uh, UN is also in, in uh, 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 modernization and uh, reform process, what we all, of course, EU and uh, my country, Slovenia, very much, uh, very much uh, support uh, a multilateral system, which is effective and can deliver. Because after all, what 
why we are here is to deliver to people. And what we missed in the, those crises is uh, we missed and we lost trust of people because we, are, we were not able to deliver. Let's be frank with uh, in this uh, discussion. I'm trying to read my intervention, but but I'm not really, you know, satisfied with it <laughs> because of that. I'm um, well. What I would like to say is that um, the discussion is all about that. Uh, we are in a globalized world. We have to deliver to our citizens uh, because, after all, it's all about our citizens and about uh, trust. And when COVID-19 disrupted our lives, uh, we perceived the multilateral system is not, uh, did not deliver uh, the, the results. Um, of course, it's not only about uh, UN. When we see it, uh, it's, uh, sometimes we see it very much uh, fragmented on the ground and uh, sometimes not effective. And sometimes we have only the feeling that we are the payer and, and UN is not seeing, perceiving us as a strategic partner. Uh, it's also to, you know, to setting the, the floor um, for, for, for maybe a discussion interaction. Um, and of course, for, from our side as well, uh, you probably notice that uh, sometimes we do not... Uh, uh, we are not perceived as, as united as, as member states, and uh, uh, and of course, what will be very important for EU um, uh, that we face uh, the challenge of unity and speaking with one uh, uh, voice. Um, of course, uh, the EU and Slovenia, my country, which will uh, uh, hold the presidency in in in, uh, in uh, 2021, the second half. For us, is very important. We are really a strong, strong uh, uh, support of multilateralism of UN, and we think that UN is really our uh, first uh, strategic uh, partner. Uh, of course, when it comes to human rights, when it comes also to disrupted, uh, uh, disruptive technologies, including artificial intelligence and framing the ethics, uh, ethic, ethical rules on that. And uh, you mentioned uh, climate, uh, the climate momentum. All our presidency will go toward uh, leading to the COP26, uh, where, of course, our, our role is also to, to um, uh, coordinate uh, the, the, the EU uh, position together, of course, with the, with the Commission and the uh, external uh, service. Um, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, what I would like uh, to say. Um, of course, uh, what are the challenges uh, of, of, of uh, uh, UN and EU uh, in this, in this uh, particular uh, moment when deal building uh, a strategic European strategic autonomy? Um, of course, for us, uh, the, in 2021, we will uh, have the consultations on the next set of joint EU uh, UN priorities on crisis management and peace operation 2022-2024. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, very important climate and security for us, uh, all the security defense nexus, the role of new technologies uh, in crisis management. And uh, what we think, and I will conclude, uh, it's really to set a political agenda in the midterm and of course to be able to uh, to organize uh, also to further en enhance our cooperation in uh, crisis prevention agenda in uh, scanning the horizon uh, together and of course uh, a strong focus on um, joint co conflict analysis and uh, clear coordination objectives in this uh, domain of crisis management, conflict prevention, peace building. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your intervention, uh, Mr. Fernandez, please. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot. And thank you for the uh, invitation to be here today. I think it's a, it's a very interesting conversation that, of course, we've been working a long time on. Um, also with Barbara, whom I, when I um, received the invitation, she was in the panel, I immediately said yes, because we are partners in crime for getting bringing the eu and the un together and i don't know if everybody knows that barbara is leaving us and i did want to um, say uh, 
very kind words and pay tribute to Barbara's work for bringing the European Union and the United Nations together here in Brussels. On top of having one of the most remarkable offices views, she also has a has taken the the trouble to walk all Rue de la Loi up and down in her years here in Brussels. And I think that the close relationship between the EU and the uh, UN is is partly because she keeps on pushing and keeps on working together with us and highlighting Brussels in New York and New York in Brussels. Um, I think picking up on the words of the uh, of the ambassador, I think it's obvious to start any of these interventions by saying the world has changed and we are in a different place where we were. The truth is that the more the world changes, the more we feel we need multilateralism. And but we need a multilateralism that delivers. And um, some might have interpreted this new approach in the commission, also in the Green Deal, uh, in the digital compass communication, uh, migration, a number of issues where it seems like the union is, um, is a bit going on a solo approach. And I think that that is a wrong reading. The EU is never closer to, has never been, I think, more close to, to promoting multilateralism. Why? Because we all agree that if you look at the state of the world, what you need is more global rules, uh, more rules-based order and not less. Um, and, and the way to get it, the only way to get it is multilateralism. Uh, and right now, the best place to talk multilateralism about is the United Nations. Whether you may say that the United Nations is fit for purpose or not, we can debate that. But right now, the only place where everybody sits and talks about the future of the world is in the United Nations. Then in many other places, we talk about other things or how to get things moving, how to move agendas. But the place where everybody sits and speaks about it is the United Nations. And that's why... Um, when we when we speak about um, COVID, when we speak about the global recovery, when we speak about picking up better, um, when we speak about vaccines, um, we are, as you have seen, very, very decisively committed to always have the multilateralism reflex. And that is something that we, we really believe in because we always think that having a everybody on board approach is much better than having a solo approach. The issue now is that, of course, we are um, looking at behaviors out there that are going more solo. And the issue of the European Union is the European Union sees itself as a bit of a, of a position where what do we do? Do we continue to embrace multilateralism, the United Nations, or do we go solo? Because as usual, these kind of approaches, when you look at them geopolitically, they have a cost. They have a cost when you choose to go multilateral, as opposed to doing solo. And, and then you have to look at how do you act and where can you act? But the main, I think the main point here is back to what I said, is the rules based. If we're able to have multilateralism that does works on global standards, fixes rules we uh, in the european union is the is the the real objective we have why because we see the work on climate change that you were mentioning we see a similar amount of enthusiasm coming together in the cop on cooming on biodiversity and we're all um, i think we're all looking or observing astonished at what is going on with the biodiversity of the planet and how it's impacting not only on our livelihoods or the livelihoods of indigenous people in a remote area, but we're also witnessing how it impacts on our health. Uh, the lack of biodiversity impacts on our health. And all these issues can no longer be solved by anyone in their own corner. Um, and, and that's why uh, we are so, uh, we're so focused on working on, on uh, the incoming COPs, as you, as you said, the incoming summits, but also the summits we had. On Friday, we had the Global Health Summit, where everybody, you know, you see all of, all of them, all of us looking at each other left and right. We have to do something. We have to do something. And 
We have to do something has the we and the something and the to do. And this is where, you know, the only place where you do that is multilateralism. But what happens if multilateralism doesn't deliver? Because, of course, we are 190 of whatever. And the European Union is a very important actor, but the European Union and its member states need to act together. The ambassador was saying, you were saying in your initial remarks, we are a very important member of the international community and hence of the United Nations. We, have, we come from a past, which is what it is, but we also need to look together at the future. And I, I very much liked, not because she's my boss, but I very much liked the quote of the president of the European Commission the other day on the Conference on the Future of Europe, when she quoted Antoine Saint-Exupéry saying, love is not only looking at each other, is looking jointly ahead. And this is what we need to learn. We need to learn how to all j look jointly ahead. And we need to bring uh, all these processes to a delivery mode. But of course, the conversation out there is very complicated. We are a lot. Sometimes the conversation, when you put it at country level, is a lot, I would say. It's, it's simpler in the sense that it's more focused. And this is the other uh, element on which the EU and the UN are cooperating strongly, is how to bring the global agendas to deliver locally in each country. How can we get our delegations, our embassies from the member states, together with the new UN resident coordinator and the reformed UN system that is trying to come together at country level? How do we become a force on sustainable development? Because this is what the planet needs. But this is also what we have agreed. It's not only that the planet needs or that someone said the planet needs it, is we have all agreed that this is what we need to do. And therefore, bringing together, you know, the, the new UN resident coordinator brings together an incredible amount of legitimacy and political clout if used properly at country level. Because they have the widest political legitimacy on SDGs that any multilateral will have. The World Bank has uh, many more financial resources. The IMF has uh, a very uh, uh, important uh, financial management uh, capacity. Uh, the EU has a, a very important political relationship with some of the countries, but the UN brings everyone together. And this is something that we're clearly exploiting as we, as we go on, not only from the financial side, but also from the political side. Because this is where I think uh, all these COPs, they need to come together. It doesn't help if we all come together in the COPs and the ministries, our ministries of environment or our ministry of economy have not done the math and the homework before coming. And this is what the UN does. This is what the UN does, what the EU do together. And this is what we, not, we need to try and, and put together. Of course, uh, you know, I have lots of things here, maybe for the more interesting uh, discussion afterwards. But what is important is uh, that we are seen and we want to be seen as a group of countries um, that tries to become a force for, uh, for conversation and for dialogue in order to produce rules and standards. And if these are not produced, we will shout, we will protest because we believe that it cannot happen that people, countries are going it solo. It just cannot happen. Not because maybe it's good or bad, but it's because the planet will not absorb it and uh, mankind will be in a difficult, much more difficult place if people do it alone. Now, from the side of the European Union, and with this I will finish, what is important to note is uh, we've set in motion a new kind of cooperation uh, modality among ourselves here in Europe uh, through the Team Europe. You've probably heard about the Team Europe and how this is unfolding. President von der Leyen uh, spoke about it on, on Friday in the Global Health Summit uh, in the issue of manufacturing capacity and others. But what we're trying to do is bring our collective capacity together and we're trying to do it in support of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, and hopefully a large agreement in Kuming on biodiversity. And that is, is going to be a very complex uh, endeavor because we are many, we're 27, we're big and small, 
We are medium sized. We have our our own characteristics, but we all share, I think, as the ambassador said, a similar vision of the world and a similar vision of multilateralism. We are for because it's the only place where we can have a conversation of where we're going and how to get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I give the floor to Barbara, let me perhaps also remind the people who are following us at this moment that you can use the chat box to uh, ask your questions. If you do so, please also indicate to whom your question is uh, directed. Uh, Barbara, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And I have to say it's a pleasure to be together finally uh, amongst human beings, although unfortunately we're not with those who are on the other side of the screen, but it's a, it's a good beginning. Um, this is very much about strategic partnership. Uh, um, Felix was saying it's about um, Brussels and New York and Brussels or Vienna or Rome, because of course the UN is present in in many places. It's really about um, the vision of the world that we share. Let's remember that Europe was very influential in the value base that is at the basis of, of the UN. Um, we, we are really a, a, a translation of, of, of the values that Europe uh, and others, but, you know, uh, put on our, on our uh, table many years ago. Uh, but it's really about how do we come together to make a difference? How, how can we make it transformational? Um, and so it is about, you know, how does Europe interact in the global north and south? I think what the UN brings to the table is the fact that it facilitates a space where the global south and the global north meet, discuss and agree on things. Um, the SDGs is, I think, a, a reflection of that, for example. Um, and an SDGs that have now not just for development, which would have been maybe in the past, but an understanding that SDGs are relevant for Europe. And I think the COVID crisis really uh, showed that, how uh, the health systems, how equality, how women's situation was indispensable uh, in Europe like elsewhere, and how there was a real need uh, for all the countries in the global north and the global south to, to commit to it and to uh, put it in practice. So it's about participating in this space, this global forum, and, and facilitating uh, the agreements, but it's also about uh, transferring it within Europe. And that's a lot of what we do. It's about uh, dialoguing with the member states, with the European institutions, with parliament, with citizens, about how important this global agenda is uh, for Europe and for the rest of the world. And then, of course, beyond the global space, it's also, as Felix said, how does it work on the ground? People tend to think of the UN as the Security Council or, you know, some of these big discussions. The relationship between the EU and the UN is a very uh, complex, interesting, diverse one, because, of course, it is about how we come together in these big spaces. For example, the whole discussion of how do we collectively as a society recover after COVID uh, is taking place. Uh, but then it's also about very specific issues uh, such as uh, the climate uh, or uh, the COPs that Felix was referring to. There's going to be the summit on um, the food summit. So it's also about, you know, the agriculture and, and how we make sure that there is a sustainable agriculture. So it's, it's very much also about helping all of us to see a different kind of world and what it means for, for the collective society. And I think this strategic partnership is of making sure that we all advance together and that we do make it uh, transformational. Let's not forget that the EU member states are also UN member states. Uh, and I think that is a fantastic opportunity um, because... European member states are influential within the UN. They have a space. But of course, as, as Felix says, if they come together in that space, uh, it, it, it is also very important. And we want to make sure as UN that there is uh, a coherence about the conversation that takes place in New York with the one that takes place uh, within Brussels. So a lot of discussion and, and um, a lot of complementarity. Um, 
And again, at the global level, so the EU is actually a very important actor, not only in the discussions, but also in the interventions that happen globally through funding, but also through policy influence. And then, of course, very much uh, on the ground. And I think that is this commitment um, to multilateralism uh, and the need to, to respond to these global challenges at the multilateral level, because that's that's where they can be tackled, uh, has been recognized, as, as you were mentioning, not only by the joint communication on multilateralism, but also on the council conclusions of 2019, uh, which, which were uh, very important and where the EU member states um, reaffirmed uh, this. From my perspective, on many of the issues that I deal with, I see Europe leading from the front uh, on many of these issues. Uh, and and I count on the EU continuing to lead on the front uh, from the front, um, and definitely on the climate and um, the uh, negotiations. Uh, but um, even on the SDGs, the fact that the president of the Commission decided to finally put because finally because this we were like at year five of the SDGs in the terms of reference of every single commissioner, not just those who deal with the external affairs, but also all of those who had to look at inside Europe was really fundamental. And a lot of the changes will happen if the hard political choices are made. So the fact that the hard political choice on SDGs is happening, on the Green Deal is happening, I think is, is very encouraging versus you know, the situation in, in many other countries. So how do we come together on this? Of course, in this dialogue, uh, you know, we can agree to disagree on certain, in certain cases, but I think the extent to which we can move forward is, is key, uh, but also where we can create the conditions for our partner countries to do so. Uh, and so, for example, supporting uh, the, um, the member countries, so the rest of the world, this global south that I talk about, in being ambitious on, on, on the climate uh, issues or on the agricultural transformation on this green uh, transition that is so necessary, both at the global meetings, these COPs, but also in practice uh, is going to be key and the Food Summit is really one of them. Um, making sure that as we tackle uh, these issues and the, re the recovering better, we don't do it just looking into short term, not just individualistic, but short term, but also looking at the longer term solutions. So the SDG is being one of these long term solutions. Um, and then, of course, making sure that when we do that, we come together on the ground locally in many of these countries, because it is about making sure that no one is left behind, both within the countries and amongst countries. We need to make sure that the countries uh, have the capacity to respond to the COVID crisis. Uh, the COVID crisis in much of the global south has not been a, a health crisis. In some countries, yes, but it is primarily a socioeconomic crisis because they have felt the impact of what has happened at, at the global economy. Now they need to pick up. So how do we, and, and actually in this, what we've seen is that inequality has been the biggest challenge in these countries because the people who have most been impacted were the ones who didn't have social protection, the one with the women, the, um, the informal sector, which is what is predominant in many of these countries. So as we build this up together as, as these countries, so how do we empower them to respond and how do we accompany this process and how do we do it together? So whilst, uh, and of course, uh, although I think many things could have been better but you know, <laughs> the circumstances certainly weren't uh, easy. Um, the UN has helped these countries uh, in their recovery plans. We have worked with them and seeing how do they put SDGs as the basis of it? How do they look at their um, NDCs, which are these, um, these, these um, investment plans that put climate at the center of it? And as the EU starts its programming, we're looking to see how do we bring together what the UN, the wealth of what the UN has done so that it can benefit the EU programming. Uh, and how do we make sure that as you look at these next seven years, we come together and make a difference. So it's not about projects. It's not about money. It's about this strategic partnership in the dialogue with, with uh, these countries considering that, you know, the, these countries are also our member states. And so they have committed to many of these issues within the global fora. So if you look at, you know, the climate discussion, um, 
the you know the, the Paris Agreement. They've, there are commitments that have taken place and on the SDGs too. So there's a whole platform where we can come together. And then, of course, there's all the peace and security, all the humanitarian. There, there are so many spaces where we, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, I mean, <laughs> there, there, there are so many countries where, where we, you, you interact with the countries together, but in many cases also through the UN, not to talk about migration, refugees. I mean, there, there are so many spaces where, where we interact. Um, of course, the UN has to deliver. This is clear. I think we all have to deliver. And, um, and there's the Secretary General has done uh, uh, an effort which is moving forward on the fit for purpose. As we did the SDGs, the first thing he said is we need to be fit for purpose as UN. The UN reform has started. The UN reform is uh, about uh, working differently as UN, uh, delivering differently and together. So it's not only about the resident coordinator system, but it's about bringing together the normative and the operational agencies. It's about, uh, for example, the, the, those who deal with the whole of government coming together with a specialized agency. So it's, it's about us working differently. Um, but it's also, of course, in trying to make sure that the development, the political and the humanitarian also come together. And this is very similar also to what the EU is doing, the whole nexus approach, for example, um, the preventing the crisis in, this, in addition to responding to the crisis. So again, a lot of complementarity. Um, it is a complex world, so it's not always just like Europe is a complex world. UN with all its member states is also complex, um, but I am optimistic. I think this crisis, this COVID crisis has made us understand that we cannot uh, continue as we were, uh, that it is not about going back. Or, uh, in fact, you'll have noticed that the UN no, does not use building back better. It's about recovering differently uh, because we need a new paradigm and we need to make sure that uh, the world of the future is the one that the youth is asking us to deliver on, which is a much more sustainable one, a much more equitable one, and one that really tackles the underlying issues, whilst also helping the countries in their immediate emergencies right now. Thank you very much. Uh, over then to our discussant, uh, Mario. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to the UN, Chris, in particular the Lombarde for bringing uh, together such uh, a qualified uh, panel. I'm very, very happy to meet you and uh, to hear to you. Uh, is an uh, outstanding, uh, uh, is, and I think uh, we converge on several crucial points. I uh, take the opportunity to welcome everybody, also in the audience, uh, in, on behalf of the Academy of Science, this building, is uh, the most important uh, cultural building in an uh, institution in Brussels and in Belgium, founded before Belgium in 1772. And the, the president of the academy from the French-speaking side, there is in Belgium a French-speaking, a Dutch-speaking side, for the French-speaking side, said me uh, to welcome uh, uh, everybody for the, to this uh, important conference. Uh, I, I, I would not speak about the academic contribution, uh, but the research contribution. We started together with UN Chris working exactly on this topic since uh, 20 years already. And uh, uh, we are really converging with very much you are saying. Uh, I will uh, start the comments uh, uh, with, uh, uh, in, in the inverse order because you are more focusing on the European Union and you are more focusing on the global. Uh, so we start uh, uh, in our research on the contradiction between uh, what uh, Fernandez said, the increasingly transnational nature of the challenges and the temptation to come back to national solution. Uh, this is a, the, the key element of the present side where the United Nations is in difficulties, the block blocked in the, the United Nations Security Council is evident. And uh, nationalism coming back is a challenge in many parts of the world. 
and, uh, and, the, and the, the problem of the, what you mentioned is the problem of delivery. I, we call the problem of the efficiency gap, the efficiency gap of the United Nations at level of, uh, of policies, policy making. So uh, we have a strong argument, which is the, the transnational nature of the challenge, in particular the priorities you mentioned, uh, environment, uh, Fernandez, and I remember we have uh, in Glasgow COP26 and in the conference you mentioned in your introduction to go beyond Paris, go beyond Paris means uh, how to Im better implement the commitments. The problem, we have a dramatic problem of implementation and uh, uh, I, I, the word that came uh, very often in your speech is how. Uh, this is the, <laughs> and it will be the crucial point of my intervention, how to do it, the problem of governance. Second, uh, the, the, I would say the health, uh, the health field, we have the, the global health conference, but we, I remember as a positive point where the European Union and the United Nations converge is the Rome declaration of last week it was a very positive uh, achievement uh, thanks to the particularly the president of the commission and uh, and the Darg, Draghi also was uh, in Villa Panfili was a very important declaration for the future pandemic Preve funding and strengthening the uh, wealth organi world health organization for future pandemic because we have to prevent at multilateral level in order to avoid the deficit of the current pandemic, uh, which were evident, at the, particularly at the beginning. Uh, so these are the good news. We can uh, also add some progress in, uh, in, uh, in uh, other policy fields, uh, particularly in uh, difficult in progress in trade and security mentioned by by you, uh, Barbara. I would say that uh, our research is particularly focusing on how. That is, uh, uh, we, have, we ask ourselves 75 years after the foundation of the United Nations. This was the reason of our book and the, the bridge with uh, the Guterres, uh, Antonio Guterres cabinet was... Uh, Possible thanks to Maria Rodriguez, which was uh, his assistant during the the Portuguese uh, presidency of uh, of Guterres, and uh, is uh, really focusing on how how do we need the treaty reform, or can we make advancement, Barbara, at level of governance reform, changing uh, to what to what extent is possible to change the governance the how without a, a treaty reform. We are, our answer is far from dreaming about a treaty reform because the veto power of the five is, uh, is there, uh, remembering how difficult the treaty reform is. But 75 years after the charter of the United Nations, we have the right to make what we call in our book, progress in uh, changes in knowledge. So understanding where the problem is, where the difficulties, where the challenges. One of the big problems that is nationalism, nationalism is not essentially incompatible with international cooperation, but should be framed by regimes, multilateral regimes making the best of national belonging in the context of the cooperation. That is the problem, the, the challenge. Uh, that is true also for Glasgow, where one of the drivers will be UK after the Brexit. Compa is compatible the Brexit with international cooperation? You see, the, the, this is a, we, I, I'm skeptical, but this is the point which is addressed in our book by Andrew Gamble of the University of Cambridge, saying that this, we have to explore how to combine national, co national sovereignty and multilateral cooperation. This is the key element to make real progress. And in our book, we focus on more binding multilateral rules. Not only we need rules, uh, Fernandez, as you very well said, but more binding rules, 
uh, ensuring uh, it cannot be, of course, the community method because this is typical of Europe. But we have to look for bind, more binding measures and we make a several proposals. For instance, the open method of coordination we explored in Europe is in a laboratory. Europe is also a laboratory. It's not only a, a political actor. It's also a laboratory for new governance solution. And one is the open method of coordination we explore for the world, well, wealth, uh, sorry, uh, World Health Organization or for ILO and others, uh, how we can make progress because we need more binding, uh, let me say, rules. And second, one of the, the way we do explore one of the avenues, we explore jointly with the UN Chris, uh, Luc Valangenove and others are working on this issue and myself, is how to take stock of knowledge. Knowledge brings us some news compared with 1945. Regions exist in every continent. In continent. N uh, research says us that what is new after 75 years, that regional cooperation exists and works in every continent. Uh, ASEAN, this, co this uh, conference uh, is a large part on ASEAN, you ASEAN, Africa Union, ECOWAS, SADEC and other. Third, uh, Mercosur, also in the Caribbean, there are regional organizations which are compatible with multilateral organizations and partner of the United Nations. That is a crucial point. We have to enhance, without changing the treaty, enhance the role of the regional organization within the United Nations system and the multilateral system without treaty change. We have a, a, a splendid lawyer in the book, Nico Schreiber, which is making concrete proposals, for example, permanent invitation to the president of the regional organizations to the, to the United Nations Security Council, uh, in the individual memoranda of understanding between the United Nations and each regional organization according to different competence, because these regional organizations are different. And so they need a different memorandum of understanding according to their competence in, uh, in relation to it. So we make concrete proposal regarding the ro enhanced role of regions in uh, global governance, in particular in the United Nations system. And first, last point regarding the global side, uh, you remember the international partnership, which is a, a commission department. We remember a peculiar European Union international partnership, the interregional partnership, interregional partnership with Eastern Asia, with Africa, with South America. The interregional must be let me say, prioritized and make compatible, made compatible with the United Nations rules in order to revive the United Nations because the status quo is not an option. It's not an option after the, the, the crisis of the last year. I conclude regarding the European Union, uh, Veronica, if you allow me, Ambassador. Uh, Slovenia is a new member state is an excellent uh, mem new member state, dynamic, loyal, and so on. But uh, there is a huge problem with veto players in the council. This conference is focusing on the Handlungsfähigkeit, so what the German called the Handlungsfähigkeit, la, the capacity to act of the European Union. How, what we must do to cope with the challenge of veto players in the Council, in the current uh, treaty context, Lisbon, or by treaty reform, if possible. I have seen Verstanger said, takes too much time, a, a treaty reform. In the current context, what we can do, because we have to cope with the issue. Last week, uh, the, block, the veto to the Palestinian resolution by Hungary was really quite provocative for many capitals of Europe. And this makes it difficult for Europe, to, even for a modest, very modest 
and understated the resolution on Palestine. That is really a, an issue for the next, for the years to come, to make the, the to cope with the problem of veto players, uh, strengthen what the European called the strategic autonomy. Veronica mentioned several papers. I add a conclude to this paper in order to clarify the political side. Fernandez mentioned the political dimension. The, not only the joint communication, uh, uh, I conclude, and the, and the council conclusion you mentioned, but also I would uh, remember uh, the book of Borel. Borel published a book on the strategic autonomy, which is full of indication. And, and finally, the Ledrian Mass, the two ministers of Germany and France, declaration of, on alliance for multilateralism. Uh, which is extremely important to support the United Nations innovation. And even, I think, what uh, in the Rome Declaration 2017 was, was uh, indicated as a differentiated integration as a solution for, for uh, the coping with the eventual veto players. But this is just one, one way, just to have uh, one point for discussion particularly within the, Euro, the, the internal condition to have an innovation of multilateralism. Because uh, Europe is both a, a, a laboratory and an actor. But to be an actor needs to have the possibility to act. If the, we need the unanimity for, of 27 for every single resolution, we have not even the declar declaratory uh, foreign policy. Not even. As that is a problem for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. Um, I'm looking at my watch. Um, I'm also looking at my screen um, and I see uh, one question that came in from uh, our audience. In, in, uh, for the sake of, of, of time and economy of time, what I would suggest is that I read the question and it's a long question, but I will read the question and then I will give you an opportunity to react to the question, but also to the interventions of, of the, your colleague uh, panelists. The question goes as follows. For all it's a question from Nidhi Nagabatla. Um, for all participants, there are various opinions as to how COVID will impact human and ecological well-being agenda, or the SDGs as a whole, in the medium to long term. While some opinions point to setbacks such as increase in dropout rate from schools, extra burden on care duties, especially for women and girls, directly impacting many targets in the SDG portfolio. Others see this as an opportunity for steering integrated agendas, uh, promoting coordinated efforts and multiple objective projects and programs, for example, wash, water, sanitation, and hygiene targets joined with COVID mitigation strategies and also post-pandemic health stability measures. Taking note of pluralism in this space, what are your insights on the need to underscore integration in context of ground operations at national and regional scales? So it's about integrating approaches to tackle um, issues um, instead of going by silos and, and specific uh, policy uh, areas one by one. So that is the question and it's the only one for the time being. So I will now give the floor in the same order I would suggest. So please, uh, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this question. Uh, I think it was a question and also a, a comment um, how to use the the, uh, the crisis, the COVID crisis to, uh, as you said, uh, recover in the right way. Uh, it's how to do it right. Uh, and I think it, 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 it is a question. Um, there is also an important element in what, what we are doing now. And I think uh, maybe... Uh, uh, my colleague from the commission will be uh, uh, more competent to, to, to say, but what, what is very important for, for, for the council, what, what we are in a process now, it's really to, to build uh, EU resilience, EU future response 
on an integrated approach. For example, in uh, in my domain of defense and security, of course, we uh, we are trying to uh, integrate to have a coherent uh, use of civil and military uh, uh, military capabilities. Uh, what we, uh, of course, uh, um, experienced in in last uh, I don't know about, uh, but for example, for my country, uh, when we reacted to the COVID crisis, even in medical devices, all that we used military. Uh, for civil civil uh, civil uh, protection uh, as well, and what we are doing in, in EU, I think the Commission has many plans now. Uh, also, an action plan on on uh, synergies about military and civil uh, uh, um, ca- capacities. Uh, we also use uh, the very important uh, challenge of disruptive technology, including artificial intelligence. Um, for uh, the civil and, 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 of course, military use when we educate uh, our children. Uh, for example, I was, uh, the main challenge is uh, distance learning and, of course, artificial I- intelligence and, and uh, educating uh, children for, for, for uh, climate, for cultural heritage. Uh, for, it's also uh, about this. And I think we are in this process. We are using uh, COVID because we, we, we are very well aware that only using one uh, capacity, one, one field is, is is, is, is not possible. We will have to, to do it in a coherent way and integrated approaches is the main principle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Fernandez. Thank you. Um, well, yes, that was a question and a comment, a long question. Um, but I think that um, when we adopted the SDGs in 2015, Everybody said there were too many. 17 is not a number you you quickly uh, understand. But when you read the 17 SDGs and you read the political program of any political party presenting itself to the elections, you see that by design, you have to come out and cover a certain number of areas that are key for social, economic, and environmental development of a society, whether global, national, or or local. And therefore, having an integrated approach, sometimes it's also having a common view and being able to understand what are the trade-offs. Because it's very easy to go out and say, we all need to decarbonize. And then you see the efforts inside the European Union. And you see that it takes a lot of political leadership to transform a society. And therefore, in order to transform a society the way in which it functions so that it functions in a completely different way, you can only have an integrated approach because you need to start touching everything that uh, does not function well in in that society or in that economy or um, or in that environment. And if you then go abroad, uh, and you start working on on a number of of competences or fields. For example, uh, when you when you say that there's an opportunity with the pandemic, because now all of a sudden we've all gone digital in a way that we never suspected a year ago that we could go digital. Um, you also need better connectivity, because the only thing that everybody complains about these days, where I live, is. I can't hear you, we don't hear you well, you're not getting good connection. Imagine when you don't have a connection at all. Or imagine when you get a connection by uh, promoting an electricity stability, which is then fueled by a fossil fuel emitting CO2. So you need an integrated approach. There's no way you can get out of it. Now, I think also what is important is to is to signal, as uh, the professor was saying, on the uh, issue of the European Union, and how can we how can we work better, and also on the United Nations um, reform process. You know, if you come, I mean, you you are much more experienced than I am, professor. But if you come to Brussels talking about treaty change, uh, everybody will start pushing you out of the door. If you go to the UN and talk about treaty change, I mean, you you don't even get to go into the door. The issue here is, um, is, and I think you also gave a couple of ideas and solutions, which we have seen in the multilateralism communication, is, you know, there are certain actors in the world that are going solo. 
but we see an increasing number of actors that are not interested anymore in going solo. And on the contrary, they're interested on multilateralism. They're interested in working together with the European Union, working together at regional level to do, to get and to bring global action. And we see those every day. There are a certain number of politics in New York, in the UN, when you see what is going on and you see the voting patterns. Uh, but that is also, you know, typical also of Brussels. If you see the Brussels neighborhood, how it works, how it functions, what reactions there are. But if you go out, you will see uh, regions like ASEAN, uh, you see uh, regions like Mercosur, you see other gatherings of countries who are really thinking very much along the lines of the European Union, is we need a system that gives us certainty and gives us rules and standards. Because we are not big enough to go solo, we are, but we are important enough to understand that we need that kind of setup for everyone to be able to kind of respect each other. And this is something that we see um, increasingly and that is one of the main uh, aspects of the, of the communication. And that's why also sometimes you speak about the veto issue here in, in Brussels and we have plenty of good examples these days. I don't need to remind you. But you see, you see less of these veto uh, examples when you go at country level. Why? Because at country level, we all need to adapt to the country level. You don't, sometimes you incorporate the dynamics that you have in Brussels, but sometimes you don't. And that's where I think also we need to start acting together a bit more, working on, uh, on, uh, on certain issues like decarbonization, uh, like recovery, a green recovery, a digital recovery, all these words that we always use, but which are for us in Europe very important because we believe that... Um, the choice, the choices that are going to be made now, I remember uh, my commissioner said in New York in the HLPF in, in July, uh, the amount of public funds that are going to be put on the table in the next two, three years is unprecedented. And our children, no, our grandchildren are going to be paying for those public funds and what they don't want to see, and I think I won't have to explain to my grandchildren, is why they continue paying for wrong policy chosen 30 years ago. And this is something that we really need to look forward. And when you look at that and you see, okay, so what are my policy choices? All you need to do is you read to read the SDGs, Agenda 2030, you need to read the Paris Agreement, and you need to say, this is where I have to go. Maybe I can go faster, maybe I can go slower, uh, maybe you know, I, need, I need to look at my finances again, but this is the direction of travel and we all need to go in that direction. And this is something that um, many, many countries are struggling with, but at the same time are clear about. They're all, you know, the, as you said, the problem is how. I don't think there are many uh, countries, maybe there are some big countries, but there are not many countries that have a doubt on the what, on the direction. I think they all have doubts on the how, on the pace. I mean, you can extrapolate the internal EU discussion all over the world. There are some countries in the European Union who think we should go very fast on everything. There are others that say, yeah, you know, but you, know, you need to calm down. Well, this is what it is. But what we have to make sure is that we build those alliances uh, for uh, making sure that we have standards and that we have rules and that we are all working on the same direction. And it's no longer, I think the, the change in, in dynamic is no longer um, that, you know, the Europeans say that we need to, you know, do multilateralism or it's the UN that all of a sudden Guterres, this new guy says, you know, whatever. It's because we have the situation we have in terms of health, in terms of uh, climate change, uh, the new digitalization, the world going collective, all the situations we have, everybody's starting to understand that we need to act collectively. And the problem is how? And the problem is that you have a 1945 treaty 
1948 uh, uh, treaty or charter. And, and this is like, you know, it's, it's bursting at the seams. But at the same time, everybody thinks this is what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's another question that came in, so I will, I will uh, read it immediately so that perhaps you can uh, take into account, taking into account the, the time limitations that we have, unfortunately. Uh, Florian Trauner, he asks uh, as follows, you talked a lot about combining multilateralism and a resurging nationalism. What practical steps, aside from the academic proposals by Professor Tello, do you as representatives of the member states, EU and UN, believe can be taken by all actors? That is the question. Uh, Barbara, your turn. Well, that's a whole new conversation, which would take a, a long while. Um, and I'll try and touch into it. I, I think I'm just to answer the first question. I'm definitely of the ones who considers that the COVID is an opportunity. Uh, and uh, and one which an opportunity for a different world and one where SDGs are at the center. Now, SDGs used to be something that were sort of goals and targets. I think with, with the COVID, they've transformed itself into real things. It's about leaving no one behind and integrating health, education, but it's about a, a, a sustainable and equitable uh, society of the future. It's it's not going to work if you just do give you know grow the economy but without looking at the sustainability or if you don't look at the inclusion of women or and you put it together with education and you know it, it's just not going to work. It's it looks nice and clean but it doesn't reflect the complexity of the world. Uh, you know and 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 what the, I think now those who are you know sensitive enough to look you know, beyond the populistic kind of approaches that exist in some countries. It's, there may be questions on faster, slower, a bit more of this or a bit more of that. But what is absolutely clear is that we have to move together. That, and, and I think the health crisis uh, showed it. You cannot have vaccines in one part of the world and think that you're going to solve the COVID crisis. You, you have to make sure that the vaccines go everywhere. And I think, you know, the COVAX initiative that the EU did was a real reflection of that. And hopefully, you know, others will follow suit also. But we, we will not advance if we don't sort of look at it across the world. Now, the question is, and I really look forward to reading your book because I'm sure it's got all sorts of interesting things. This, this discussion about binding or not binding is one that exists and we've had for a long time. The issue is in this complex world made of so many countries with so many different interests, you are binding on the basis of whose agenda and who decides what is binding. It's very complex in, in a space like the UN. Uh, the, the, there was a big discussion when the SDGs were discussed on whether it should be binding or not. And at least insofar as the SDGs were concerned, the fact that it was not binding, but that there was peer pressure and the mechanism through which the voluntary reports had started coming out. So there was like a race to move forward and to be as good as the others, to do as much as the others. You know, even for Europe, the fact that it, at some stage it had to go and present its own report, it obliged Europe to sort of see, so how are SDGs relevant to us? What is it that we are doing? So sometimes, uh, you know, within a, this complex world made of global south and global north, global east and global west, and uh, it, you, you do want to create a system where you encourage a consensus building. And of course, the SDG agenda is complex and there are many goals, but it's because it's the coming together of the visions uh, of, of different realities in the world where the global south said, yes, if you want to have a sustainability, uh, an environmentally sustainable world, you need to look at, you know, the production and the consumption modalities too. And so this generates a whole different reflection and a different way of moving forward. But as I said, I really look forward to, to looking at your book and, and, and understanding how it could happen. And of course, the regions are key. Uh, but, you know, the regions are growing also and have their own complexities, as we all know, you know, in, in different parts of the world. So we, we collectively support the regional entities and... and um, of course, we need to sort of see how, how they can be part of, of the global conversations and some of the things you mentioned uh, will be key. 
So, you know, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. I think that's part of the function of, of a UN official. It's about looking at opportunities and possibilities of encouraging the world to move in that trans direction and being transformational. In the extent to which we create these strategic partnerships, we move together, we have this vision, we see how we can support one another, how we complement our actions, then it's possible. Uh, but of course, we don't need to, we, sh we're not, we should not be naive. Uh, there's a difference between being optimistic and naive. Um, there is a lot of geopolitics involved. And I think we need to address these at the global level, but we need to look at the local level because that's also where we can make a difference. And that's where we can involve our partner countries to be in the lead. We are supposed to support these partner countries in doing their own uh, planning. And that's how we've done it. We've helped them look at their SDG agenda, see what they need to do. And then we come in to see how we can support them in doing this. And there we can complement. The UN can do one part, the EU can do another part, the banks do another part. And we actually have an initiative in that sense that will, will help it moving forward. So it's, it's a part of pragmatism and it's a part of idealism that have to come at play. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, have Mario. Time. Yes, you have time, but the time is limited. If yes, very limited because uh, I I just uh, say that uh, I I would like to underline uh, words pronounced by by my partner here in the panel. First of all, COVID is an opportunity for a step forward, as Barbara said. The problem is how, because the funding is important priorities in technical way to the to precise is very important but the key issue is governance how to do in lo at, at local level uh, in, uh, our shared idea is that uh, regions matter should matter more than before in the implementation for in enhance the legitimacy and efficiency of the United Nations system. And secondly, maybe triangular uh, project, including uh, United Nations re re region, like the African Union or, uh, or ASEAN, and the uh, European Union. This could be also a way out. And also use the interregional relation of the European Union to foster and underpin this project, including the trade and interregional relations of the European Union in order to strengthen the WTO uh, multilateralism. How binding? And finally, uh, Barbara addressed the question, to what extent can we be a laboratory, a model for the world? I don't use the word model. Because uh, Europe is small. We are 5% of the global population, 20% of the GDP. But uh, realistically, we have uh, some experience of governance beyond the state, which can be interesting abroad for the United Nations and for the regions abroad. One is the open method of coordination. It's not only uh, Fernandez. I agree about the peer, pr peer pressure and about your intervention in general. I would add is the open metro coordination, I would add national plans consistent with the guidelines approved by the multilateral organizations. And secondly, a regular monitoring of the follow-up. This is the, the open metro coordination. And then possible recommendation to the bad guys who don't follow their own national plans. So this is a, a idea. I, I repeat, the regions are case, as you said, and optimist or pessimist. Optimist provided that the European Union answer the question of this conference. Capacity to act, handlungsfähigkeit, capacity to act. And this is the problem of the council Decision-making is crucial, in my opinion. I have not a solution now. I have my ideas, but I don't propose this. But this is key because if every uh, step towards a strategic autonomy is stopped by one single country for just for national needs of propaganda, that is doesn't work. And uh, all the idea of a geopolitical commission is weakened. That is the big, the big problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. In uh, 
pre-COVID times, we would be a bit more flexible on, on time, uh, I suppose, as we are now. So there is no flexibility, unfortunately. There are just a few minutes left. Uh, um, is there any additional comment you would like to make? Uh, an urgent comment to add to what you have said so far? No? Uh, Mr. Fernandez, and that is then the last uh, intervention, and then we will close. Thank you. Excuse me, if you could use the microphone, please. Yeah. One of the um, places where I think we, we all need to focus and the partnerships of the European Union and the UN are being very clear, and that is, is Africa. Uh, Africa is a continent um, that is going to, we would have said explode years ago. I think we, I will say explode, but of enthusiasm. It's a, it's a continent that is going up. And if you look at the rest of the world, in fact, meeting many of the goals and many of the objectives that we have will depend on whether Africa chooses for itself one or other uh, uh, path. And I think that's one of the main elements of the uh, EU-UN uh, uh, partnership. But it's also one of the big elements of the EU-Africa partnership, as we've just finished the Cotonou. And I think it would be it will be very important for all of us to focus on uh, the recovery in Africa. There's dire needs, but if you look at what's happening, the vitalism and enthusiasm of the continent is incredible. And we need to, I mean, all of us, the whole world needs to support Africa in developing that enthusiasm in, let me finish by saying, a green, digital, just and resilient way. Thank you. Team Europe is a really a way which is a, a model. 3.4 billion for Africa out of 20 billion for Team Europe. And the priority is a economic recovery health system reform, and not only uh, emergency. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, unfortunately, we, we have come already at the end of, of our session. Um, so we will have to conclude here, not without thanking all the panelists for their contributions to this uh, panel. Also, thank you very much, uh, the people who have been following us uh, from behind their screens. This session has been recorded and will be made available in some form or another uh, later. So thanks again uh, to all and uh, goodbye.